Nance, this is going to sound like some hogwash story, but I swear this is what really happened to me. Feel free to use it on your story channel, but please change my name to something like John because my name is pretty unusual. I had been working for years renovating and flipping different properties, which mostly was good money. But during the housing and economic downturn, it was hard to make a profit as a little guy. So I joined forces with a realtor who had much deeper pockets than I did. The deal between us was that he would do the buying and the selling, and I'd do all the work. This was a really good deal for me, as I would get paid no matter what and I wasn't carrying all the risk or waiting for a house to get sold, so I got my money. One of the properties he purchased was a pretty run-down piece a few miles from Malabar Farm State Park. It didn't actually touch the park, but there are enough tree patches of land that they all sort of link up to the park, if you cross a road or two. The park isn't really relevant to the story, other than just to give you an idea of where this happened. This property was the proverbial dirty gym. It had a good bit of land that had had mixed use, but the house was so wrecked, nobody would even come to look at it. Once on the property, I quickly realized that this house had been used to make meth. There's no mistaking that smell. It's one I've ran into many times over the years when buying houses at auction. Now I lived about 30 minutes away, so I did what I had done at lots of properties that I had worked on over the years. I brought my pop-up camper out and parked it on the property. This allowed me to work whenever I wanted and it saved me not going back and forth every day. This way, I could work five 16-hour days instead of 10 8-hour days if I so chose. And I did that sort of thing as much as I could because I was paid by the job, not by the hour. The house sat back from the road maybe 80 or 90 feet. The front of the property was shoehorned in between the neighboring properties, giving it a relatively short piece of frontage on the road from that side. From the back of the house, the land spread out in a funnel shape. Part of the land had a long section that was cleared and had previously been farmed at some point. The other section headed off to the right side of the funnel shape and was heavily wooded, and this piece actually wrapped around the back side of the neighbor's land and then went out to the far side where the road curved, giving the property another piece of road frontage but there was no driveway access from there, just trees. So, it was a lot of land, and good land too, but it was really in need of some work, but that wasn't what I was there for. I did, however, poke around throughout the land just to see what was there the first day or two I was there. But I have to say, I didn't see anything to write home about other than it's a nice piece of land. Anyway, I set my camper up out back under the edge of the first curve of trees. Now this was about 50-55 yards from the back of the house. I chose that spot because the sun would be blocked for most of the day and that meant my camper would be cool at night when it was time for me to quit work. At this point it was early June and was starting to get really really warm and humid. But this night it was nice enough that I had the windows of the camper open and then I started to hear these weird screams. It was maybe 10 o'clock when I heard the first one. I heard a couple more after that, but I didn't think much about it and thought maybe it was just a coyote in distress or something like that. I'm no animal person, I don't hunt, so I just trusted that what I was hearing was pretty normal and went about eating my late dinner. Now once or twice over the next few nights, I would wake up in the camper in the middle of the night, and I wouldn't know what had woken me up. One night, I had the distinct sensation that there was someone right outside the camper, and so I got up to investigate, but I didn't see anyone. A few other odd things began to happen here and there, but nothing that made me alarmed. 
it was just small stuff like finding things that I had left outside the camper had been moved or turned over while I was in the house working all day. Or when I got up in the morning, I would notice things had been moved. But I always passed everything off as either I had done it and forgot it, that it was the wind, or some squirrels were playing havoc on me, or whatever. But everything I saw seemed to have a perfectly reasonable explanation to me at the time. A few nights later, I had set out some things to grill on the small little table that I had outside the camper. It was starting to get dark, which in June meant it was probably around 9 p.m. Beyond the charcoal grill, I had a camping lantern on the table for light. Now there were four hamburger patties and two pork chops on the plate that I had set on the table. I planned to have two hamburgers for my dinner that night, set aside two to reheat for lunch tomorrow, and the two pork chops were to have with hash browns the next two mornings for breakfast. I usually grilled things in batches so that I had food ready to go for the next day or two and it saved me on charcoal and time. It doesn't take any more charcoal to grill four hamburgers than it does to grill two. I also had potatoes in a foil packet, as I recall, but those weren't of any interest to the Bigfoot. Yes, I said the Bigfoot. I had set everything down on the table and realized I had forgotten the grilled tools inside, and so I went back in the camper to get them, and while in there, I thought about a few more things I would need if I wanted to eat outside. I poked around, and I wasn't in a hurry, as the charcoals in the grill weren't quite gray yet. But as I started to come out of the camper, I was a little puzzled for just a second, because I didn't see the glow of the grill or the small lantern on the table that stood between the camper and the grill. Then I realized that the light was being blocked by something very large standing between me and the camper and the grill and the table outside. I stood there at the little door of the camper for just a fraction of the second as my brain tried to work out what my eyes were seeing and not seeing. Then the thing moved, and I suddenly saw the glow of the grill again and the light from the table lantern again. And I looked over to the side and watched what was definitely a Bigfoot walking away from the area of the camper. The light from the lantern on the table giving me a very good view of a very furry backside. I stood there stunned for a few more seconds, not believing what I was seeing through the screen part of the door. This had to be a joke, right? But what I had seen was taller than my pop-up camper and had been wide enough to effectively block the light outside as I stood in the doorway of the camper. That couldn't have been a person, I thought. Oddly, I wasn't scared, really. But once I was over being a little puzzled, I stepped outside the camper to have a look around. Nothing had seemed threatening in this little encounter, and at that point I had never heard of anything scary in relation to Bigfoot. And yes, I had heard about him. Up to that time, I had always been told they were very peaceful creatures, and truth be told, I really did expect that what I had just seen was still somehow a case of mistaken identity, or I was confused with the fading light, and what I had seen was a bear standing upright. But no matter what I really thought about it, everything seemed absurd and ludicrous, at least as much as seeing a Bigfoot. Honestly, my mind was busy explaining everything to me in a logical fashion. After looking around and seeing that whatever it was was definitely gone, then I began to get really, really miffed. Okay, pissed. I was pissed off when I discovered that the creature, the hoaxer, if it had been one, whoever or whatever it was, had stolen the meat from my dinner. That's right, my burgers had just been burgled. Bigfoot, Bigfoot hoaxer, or whatever, you just don't go around stealing a hungry man's dinner, I thought. I was pretty outraged. 
Now this seems pretty stupid and nonchalant as I write it out now, but really I was pissed off at the loss of my dinner more than anything else. You see, I had been working hard all day and I had been looking forward to that dinner for the last couple hours that I had been inside the house sweating and working in the heat. And now I was faced with no dinner to speak of. I couldn't put much in the tiny little fridge inside my camper, and I had to be judicious about the amount of propane I used. So, that was pretty much what I had as far as meat goes for the next couple days. And Bigfoot burgled it. The foil of packet potatoes, however, was still on the table. I had a couple more potatoes inside, and I added them to the foil and grilled them up. You will be amused to know that I put cheese on those potatoes and then piled them on the hamburger buns that I had. Okay, that wasn't as good as a real hamburger, but better than just potatoes alone. So while Bigfoot the Hamburglar was dining on my burgers and chops, I was eating vegetarian that night. Now there was something really wrong with that in my opinion. But for the record, Bigfoot seemed pretty happy with it that way, because I heard several of those happy, weird, screaming noises as I sat there and ate my lonely potatoes. And yes, I did think those screams sounded happy that night. Now the next day I went out and I got some more food and deliberately brought extra in case I became a victim of meat napping again. I was also determined to never leave my food unattended again, and I also contemplated moving the camper closer to the house. But I really wasn't quite willing to give up the cool shade, and I didn't know if that would keep the burger thief at bay or not. I suspected not. I still wasn't overly alarmed if it was a Bigfoot at this point or not. So, round two between me and the burger thief. Ding, ding. I started the grill that night, got everything ready inside, and didn't take anything out until it was time to put the meat on the grill. The whole time, I did feel like I was being watched. I started the whole grilling thing earlier than normal, just so I could have more light. Not because I was scared, but because I really wanted to make sure I could see clearly all around me and the camper. I finished grilling, and then took my food inside to eat. While I did so, I was very conscious of a feeling of being watched as I ate. And eventually, I pulled the interior tarp curtain across the screened-in portions and velcroed them closed while I ate. Before sleep, I heard a few more of those screams, but they sounded more distant than the previous night, so I went to sleep feeling like I had won round two. <laughs> but oh no, I had not. I guess I had managed to piss off a hungry Bigfoot who wasn't pleased that that night he was not able to walk through Johnny's burger joint and steal him some burgers that night. Or maybe he had watched me eat those burgers that he'd been smelling all evening on the grill. I don't know, but I do know I was very wrong about winning round two. I awoke to the camper moving violently. Before I was fully awake, I found myself falling as the entire camper was tipped up on its side. It had tipped over to where the door was now against the ground. It took me another fraction of a second to figure out what the heck had just happened. As I've mentioned, it was a pop-up camper, so it wasn't like I couldn't cut my way out if I had to. But I wasn't so sure that I was ready to get out of that camper in any way at that moment. I could hear shuffling and movement outside, but my only view was of the rubber foam mattress that had come off the bed when the camper tipped, which probably helped protect me from other stuff getting tossed around, because now the camper was getting punted sideways along the ground, and with each shove a few more things would fall or tumble from a cabinet or out from under something else. It felt like something was just going from side to side, pushing it, scooting it, the way a single person will move furniture in their house when there's no one to help them. The roof of the camper, I could feel, was beginning to dig into the ground, 
because the camper really wasn't scooting, and I began to fear that the metal pieces of the camper lift would buckle, and I envisioned getting squished. So I managed to crawl out of the bedding area, which extended outside the main square of the camper, and worked my way back into the center of the camper as best as I could. Now at that time, the only clear view I had out was of the side screened in windows, which were now pointing up to the sky. I heard grunting and huffing noises from the other side of the wheelbase camper, which was now the side of the camper pointing out to the trees and from where all the pushing was coming from. Still worried that the metal braces for the lifting mechanism on the camper would buckle, I started yelling out to stop it and to knock it off. I didn't know if it would do any good, but I was now pretty worried, and all the previous nonchalance from the night before was gone. The camper did stop moving, but I knew the Bigfoot hadn't left. I could hear it breathing hard, I assumed from all the exertion and movement it had been doing in scooting my camper. I then felt a few hard hits to that side of the wheelbase, as if it was just being slapped. I realized as I looked up and out through the screen windows of the camper that pointed up to the sky that as easy as it might be for me to get out of this camper if I needed to, it was just as easy for that creature to get in to grab me if it wanted to. Now, though I had never needed to use it in all the years that I had been doing house renovations, because I was often in dicey situations with former meth labs or foreclosed homes, I did have an old thirty-eight revolver. Somewhere. I didn't know where. I knew where it was before the camper was tipped over, but now, in the darkness and the chaos of everything that had been thrown around, I had no idea. After a while, it went mostly quiet outside. The pushing had stopped, and the agitated slaps had gotten farther and farther apart, and those two had finally stopped. But I still wasn't sure that the Bigfoot had left, and I didn't want to pop my head up out of the camper to find out. I was now behind the screw-top table between the dining benches. I say behind and not under, because with everything on its side, the tabletop was now vertical and I was using it like a shield. It wasn't much, but still, it was the best protection I had at the moment. This put me within the main frame of the camper, and the tabletop was another barrier. I stayed quiet here for some time. I have no idea of what time all of this started, as I had been asleep and I had no way to tell the time once the camper was on its side. But I do know it was a long time until I saw the sky above me getting light. Now I had a lot of time to think about what had happened as I sat there in the dark behind my table shield. It seemed stupid to think that I had made a Bigfoot angry by eating my own food, but I didn't know what else to think. Since then, and reading more on Bigfoot, I kind of think of them as acting like a bear. When they find food somewhere once, they will return to look for more. And when they don't find any food, they can get really angry. Anyway, as it started to get lighter, I was able to sift through the contents of spilled items in the camper, and I finally found my phone. I put a call in to my brother-in-law, and I just told him that my camper had been turned over in the night by a wind gust. I explained I wasn't hurt, and that this wasn't a call for emergency services and the like, and that I just needed his help getting out of the camper and trying to set it upright to assess the damage. He asked a few questions that I really didn't know how to answer, so I just kept repeating for him to please come help me. Now, at this point, he had been my brother-in-law for 16 years, and we knew each other very well, and he knew very well that I was feeding him a big, fat lie. But he came out anyway, even though he lived just over an hour away. 
I told him to call me when he got close, and I'd guide him to the property. Now here's a funny thing. I could not remember the actual address of the property that I had been working at for almost two weeks. I could tell him how to get there, but for the life of me, I could not give him an address. I also had another motive to have him on the phone when he did get to the property, of course, as I wanted him to make sure there was nothing near the camper before I got out of it. Now, luckily, my truck is a bright red with all of my information printed on it, and I had left it parked near the front of the house, and it was very visible from the road, so he was able to find me without too much difficulty. I told him to stop when he got close to the camper and to make sure there wasn't anything out there. He asked why. I told him I think some coyotes had just been out there, or maybe some wild dogs. Again, I know he didn't believe me, but he confirmed for me that there was nothing out there. The sound of his truck pulling up to the camper was a tremendous relief for me. In the end, my brother-in-law didn't believe a single word of my story about any of it being a gust of wind or that there might have been coyotes or wild dogs hanging around the overturned camper that morning. At the time, I didn't know what he thought had happened, but I know he didn't believe me at the time. Sometime later that year, this whole incident came up between us late one night, and after a few beers, I told him what had really happened and what I had seen. I expected ridicule, but strangely, he believed me. Not that he really believes in Bigfoot, but he said that he had seen the marks in the ground where the camper had been pushed, and that was something that wind gusts just don't do. He said that he also saw what he thought was a well-worn path between the camper area that led back into the trees. But he said the biggest thing that made him realize something serious had happened and that whatever it was had to have been serious and real was another issue. And I hate to mention this issue, but the fact is that the human body does its own thing on its own time schedule. Yes, I had to answer a call of nature during those hours that I waited for dawn, and I could not and would not exit the camper. Let's just say I did the best I could under those circumstances. But it wasn't something I could hide from my brother-in-law once we had righted the camper, which that in itself is another story, but not Bigfoot related. Anyway, in the end, I don't know that he believes that what I saw was a Bigfoot, but he does believe something pretty scary happened to me out there. As for the house, I did get it finished, but I didn't make much money from the job as I ended up hiring a few guys to help me out, and I ended up driving 30 minutes each way every day until it was done, but I slept safely in my own house every night. So, Nance, that's the story of my encounter with a large, hairy Hamburglar. I know it sounds ludicrous and funny, but that's really what happened. Thanks a lot. Just call me Johnny. Hi, Nance. Here's my story. Hope you can use it. Sorry it's so long. We've spent three days on and off between me and my wife trying to type this out so it makes sense. This is hard to talk about, but my son from my first marriage has a bad drug problem. Like many drug addicts, he has stolen from us and become violent. The violence thing is what made us move. My current wife and I had three young children together aged two, seven, and nine at that time. My son, the drug addict, knew I could not be bullied or intimidated by him into giving him money or letting him in the house. So he started to come to the house when he knew I was gone at work. My wife is a stay-at-home mother who homeschools our children, so this means that she and my three young boys were home alone often. One day he showed up, and when she wouldn't let him in, he left but came back later with two friends, and together the three of them broke into the house, ransacked the house, stole a lot of things, 
and knocked my wife around a good bit and terrorized my three children over the course of about an hour and a half. That was my final straw. I'm only telling you what happened so you understand why we did what we did next, which others have told me was not only extreme, but cruel. Of course, we got the police involved, and there were restraining orders, judge orders, and about every other kind of order there is available. But sometimes law enforcement's hands are tied as to what they can and can't do. And we knew it. Through all of it, he got 90 days in the county lockup, so we decided to make use of that time. I applied for jobs like MAD in other states. I didn't care what state. I was applying everywhere and anywhere that had a listing for my field of work. The first real job that came through with an offer that was enough for us to live on, I took it. Now that's how we ended up out in the wilds of New York. The job isn't there in the wilds, but it's near enough by that I managed to commute. As soon as I had that job nailed down, the house went up for sale, which we actually sold at a small loss just to get out of there and move. We didn't even do forward address at the post office. I did not want my son to have a clue as to where to begin looking for us, and I knew that he would. So then we found this house we're in now. We saw it on the internet and literally put in a bid without ever having seen it in person or stepped foot on the property. Incredibly, it was very similar to our current floor plan, which is the basic tri-level house plan common from the 1970s. Now, unlike the house previously, this one doesn't sit in the middle of a suburb, but is out on a quiet country road surrounded by trees. Now, the house was in need of work, which we really weren't thrilled about, but it did fall into our price range. It was where we needed, so we jumped on it. We reasoned that if we turned out to be unhappy, we could put a little money into it and then move again in a year. Right now, we just needed to move, and we couldn't see anything else beyond that. At that point, the night that we put in the bid on the house, my son had 51 days left in the county lockup. The clock was ticking for us. But we did make the move, and we made it with six days to spare before my son got out of jail. The first few weeks in our new home, we were all pretty jumpy and on high alert. But as summer went by, we all settled down. It was peaceful and quiet. I struggled a lot during then over the guilt of having what I thought of as abandoning my son, but I had to protect my wife and children, and once he moved on from stealing my credit cards and my mother's wedding ring to hawk and other general thievery, and he moved on to violence when we couldn't just give him what he wanted or give him the opportunity to steal it from us, well, I felt I had to. I had to cut that cord like I did. Yes, it hurt. It still hurts. So any of you listening, please don't judge me. I struggle still some days with it. So now you know this backstory. Here's where the Bigfoot comes in. After we moved, the kids were very isolated. So we spent more than we really could afford and bought one of those big outdoor wooden play centers with the little Fort Playhouse thing on top. It helped distract them quite a bit the first few months, especially as they weren't close enough to go to the park weekly as they once had when we lived in the suburbs. But they kept suddenly telling us that there was a monkey out there sometimes in the woods that watched them while they played. Now, we put it down to just kids being imaginative and doing their playtime storytelling. But when my wife began to tell me that they were asking for extra sandwiches to take out to feed the monkey, I began to wonder. She thought they were just being growing boys and trying to get extra food on the sly, as boys do. But I wasn't so sure. They hadn't hit the teenage, non-stop, eat-you-out-of-house-and-home phase yet. So one night, I asked them about the monkey. They said he was a big monkey. They said 
He was taller and bigger than me, but had red fur. The exact words were, He's furry like Dutch. Now Dutch was the Irish setter that our old neighbor in Illinois had. Now that didn't sound monkey-like to me, but they said his face was smooth like a monkey. What they ended up describing sounded more like an ape or a gorilla, but I don't think those young boys knew the difference at that time. They said when they took some ham sandwiches out to eat in the playhouse one day, the monkey man was out in the trees and came closer. My oldest said that he didn't eat all of his sandwich, so he took it out to the monkey man who started to back up when he got close to the trees. So he just put the sandwich down, turned around, and went back to the playhouse. He wanted to make friends with it, or maybe he said the monkey was nice and just wanted a home. I guess that's how kids just think, right? Anyway, my seven-year-old said the monkey had gotten the sandwich and eaten it in two bites before my nine-year-old had made it back to the playhouse area. I started asking a lot of questions. I was alarmed and thinking that maybe there was a bear and they had just fed it a ham sandwich up close. But they were very clear that it had walked on two legs, did not have a snout or ears that they could see. They said over and over that it had a monkey face but was red and brown. Repeatedly, they described the face as wide, flat, a heavy brow, dark eyes, and a big wide mouth. No neck. I'm still worried at this point that my boys had just done the stupidest thing they could do, which was feed the bear at close range. So I took them over to the computer and I showed them pictures on the internet of bears and then monkeys, but they said no to both of them. I then showed them gorillas, and they said it was a lot like that, but not quite. In my mind, I still didn't think they knew exactly what they had seen, but I was still worried. At that moment, lots of crazy thoughts were going through my head about what it might have been that they had seen. Was it a hunter in one of those camouflage suits? Do they make those in red colors? I didn't know. Had my drug addict son somehow tracked us down? Was he living in the woods and disguising himself, waiting for another moment to break in? Or was it someone else? They too may be dressed in a disguise, but just watching the house while I was away at work? Really, things like that were going through my head. Those all seemed more likely to be real than anything else I could come up with. I told them to not give the monkey man any more food and to let me or mom know the next time they saw him. Two days later, my seven-year-old came tearing into the house, told me the monkey was out there, then took off back outside before I could say much else, but not before grabbing a loaf of bread off the counter by the fridge. Now, I had just gotten home from work, and it was heading up to around maybe six o'clock, and it was late September, so the sun was already going down a bit, leaving the area and the trees fairly dark looking from the house. But I went over to the sliding doors that went outside to have a look. I could see my seven-year-old had climbed to the top of the fort. His back was now to me, and he was pulling bread out and throwing it beyond the play area. I wasn't sure what was what, but whatever it was, I was going to put a stop to this. I walked out back, and I yelled for him to get back in the house. That's when I noticed something colored dark and rusty red moving between the wood play area and the trees. I could just see the movement through the slats of wood behind the sand area they played in. The top part of whatever it was was blocked by the little playhouse fort above. That scared me to the bone. There really was someone out there. I quickly jogged over to the side of the play area to try to get a look at whoever it was and confront them. But I could only see the back of something large and reddish color suddenly going deeper into the trees by the time I got there. 
and I thought how quickly it had to have moved to cover that distance. Behind the play area were several pieces of bread lying on the ground. Suddenly scared, I made the boys go back inside. My hackles were raised. Everything suddenly felt very, very wrong, and my stomach felt sick and was all tumbling. Someone or something was getting awful close to my boys. I had a conversation with my wife, and we decided that for the time being, the boys were now under a form of house arrest, so no more could they go out and play by themselves, and never were they allowed to take food outside. Now, at first, this was hard to enforce. As I mentioned, they are homeschooled, so for them, their recess is outside. But this actually became quite easy to enforce, as in the next few weeks the temperatures were beginning to drop drastically, and we were getting very frequent rain, keeping them inside anyway. And both my wife and myself began to spend a lot of time looking out the windows behind the house. I even bought one of those little small drones and flew it to see if I could see anything in the trees once the leaves were all gone. But I never did. Other than the monkey man incident, our time there had been peaceful, quiet, and all the stress, worry, and fear from the earlier part of the year had begun to just fall away. I heard from one of my old co-workers that my son hadn't been out of jail a month before he was picked up on the charges of intent to sell illegal substances and selling illegal weapons. Now that got him serious time in a place a lot more serious than our old county lockup. So we were beginning to breathe much easier. That all changed, though, in the weeks before Christmas. We were riding the happiness high, and despite money being very, very tight after all our moving expenses that year, we splurged and bought outdoor lights for the house strings of lights to run along the driveway, and more lights for the trees out front. That Saturday morning, I was out the door as soon as it was light. It was cold, and we'd had snow a few days before, but I got the main outline of all the house peaks lit up. That afternoon, the two older boys and myself put the net lights on the trees out front, and although it was getting dark, we went ahead and got the stakes out and started setting the lights along the driveway. We had worked our way down maybe a third of the driveway when the oldest said to me that the monkey man was back and he was watching us. Again, hackles raised on the back of my neck. I had forgotten almost about the whole monkey man incident after all this time. I knew now it wasn't my son that found us. I raised up and turned to look into the trees lining that side of the driveway where my son was pointing. At first, I didn't see anything, but then I saw it. It was the monkey man, all right. The glow from the coil of string lights combined with the white light from the two net trees that were draped in lights combined with the white snow still on the ground gave just enough ambient light to see just inside the trees there. But all I got in the glow was really the impression of its shape. But I will say to you, I'm very clear on that shape. I measured the tree it was standing near the next day, and it was between six foot eight and six foot ten as best as I can gauge it. I didn't see any of the things I've since read about. No red eyes, no eye shine, none of that. It also didn't make a sound, and I never heard it. Even with the snow on the ground out there, I never heard it get that close to us, and it was maybe 20, 25 feet. But it was very wide, and I could clearly see that between the trees it stood by. The reddish fur looked darker to me than it had the time that I saw it retreating into the trees when I didn't know what I was looking at. Maybe it just looked that way because it was dark. Maybe it was a different Bigfoot, 
Maybe their fur changes color with the seasons. I didn't know. Another thing in that outline that I saw with the thing standing between the trees and the snow was that it didn't have a neck like other animals. And the boys were right. There was no snout and no ears that I could see. But you know how you know when you've made eye contact with someone, even if you can't clearly see their eyes? I had that feeling very strong. I did have a rubber mallet that I had been using to drive the stakes into the ground, but that was it. And I figured that rubber mallet against that thing I saw standing there was as good and useful as a screen door is on a submarine. It was maybe a three or four second delay from the time I saw it and looked at it until I started quickly herding the boys back down the driveway toward the house. As they walked forward, I was literally walking backwards to keep my eye on it. We had covered about half the distance back to the house when I really had a heart attack, I think, because it started following us along the tree line. I yelled for the boys to run and get in the house. I was going to call Essex County when the boys begged me not to and stopped me. Frantically, they said that it was probably just waiting on them to bring the food. That's right. Now the story came out. Despite everything I had told them, they had disobeyed me and had never stopped sneaking food out to the woods. But they hadn't been able to that day, they said, since I'd been out and around the house all day. I hit the roof. I had been clear that they were not supposed to be out there and they were never supposed to be taking food. And since that first monkey man sighting a few months ago, I had started to do some reading. And I was pretty sure that that was a Bigfoot slash Sasquatch, whatever you want to call it out there. The thought that my kids were feeding one put my blood pressure into stroke range. Now, not knowing any other way to get through to them, I told them very clearly what I believed it was. And then I pulled up as many pictures on the internet as I could find of what one supposedly looks like. Yes, I showed them the Patty film. And I then read all sorts of reports to them that showed that feeding them was a really bad idea. And I stressed again and again the weird thing that Sasquatch seemed to have for children. Now, I think that got through to them, especially my older boy. He got it. Now, my wife wasn't really sure about any of it. She still had not seen it. Later that night, she asked me if I just made all that up to scare them. I saw she was scared and worried, but I told her that I really did see that, and that is what I thought was out there. I didn't want to lie to her, and I wanted her to be aware. After all we had been through with my son, I really, truly wasn't worried about coming up against a Sasquatch, for what it's worth. My concern was only for the safety of my young sons and my wife. After I put the fear of God into the boys, to my knowledge, they never went back out into the trees again, nor were they feeding the Sasquatch. For the record, I did see it a few more times throughout the winter. I do think it was hanging around looking for food, or my boys, or maybe both. But after a while, I didn't see it anymore, and I haven't seen it for the last four years, so I think it got tired of waiting for a food delivery service that never showed up and moved on. The boys are older now, and oddly, they don't remember much about the monkey man, which is a good thing, I think. Now, that's my story. Yes, we did. We stayed in this house. Truth is, we like where we are, and another hard truth is, that after all the financial devastation my son had caused us over the last several years, combined with the hardship of such a drastic move, we really could not afford to move again so quickly, even if we had wanted to. So we stayed where we were. 
And really, other than the Monkey Man incident that first year, it's been peaceful, lovely, and we are very happy here. Hi, I just want to tell you about the two times I saw a Bigfoot when I was working as a Jewel Tea Man. If you don't know what that is, we used to drive around in a truck and we sold all sorts of things to people. Mostly, we dealt with the same people every month. So we got to know a lot of our customers, which back then was mostly women at home. I had a route in part of South Central Ohio and Central Ohio in 1972. I saw a Bigfoot there for the first time. I was heading south out of Zanesville on Old River Road, which was part of it running next to the Muskingum River. Now there is very heavy tree growth between the road and the river now, but at that time it wasn't like that. There were a few places where you could see down to the river. One day it had been rainy and it was pretty early in the morning. While driving, I was able to see a Bigfoot for about two or three seconds between the trees as I drove. It was just down at the river, and it looked like it was starting to wade into the river. I don't know what it was doing, and I didn't get to see it long enough to say, but it was larger than any human could have been, and nobody would have tried wading into the river in a big furry suit like that on. I thought about trying to turn around to go check it out, but there really wasn't anywhere to stop or turn around, and I wasn't sure that I really wanted to go check it out, and I also knew that I had seen a Bigfoot. The second time, it was a lot more close up. I was at a customer's house outside of Crooksville. She was a nice lady and was mostly wheelchair bound in the house. She was widowed and lived there with her adult daughter. Anyway, she always made a big deal out of me showing up every month. She didn't get to leave the house much, so it was very much a social visit for her. She also got very excited because she could do her own shopping since she didn't get out to the store very often. Now that doesn't sound like much to me and you maybe, but to someone who's housebound, it's a big deal to get to pick your own things. Anyway, I always planned 45 minutes to an hour just to be with her on that route. The house was older, I'd say from the 1920s, and she couldn't maneuver very well around most of the house because it had narrow doors, hallways, and stairs. So at some point, they put an addition onto the back of the house that met up with the kitchen. She lived mostly in the new addition. At the time, it looked very odd to me to have a kitchen without walls or cabinets closing it in all around. But I know today it's popular and they call it an open floor plan. It was not common that I saw it back then. After four years of monthly sales visits with this lady, even though she could wheel herself into the kitchen, I usually was the one that made the coffee and got the cookies off the top of the fridge for our little visit and chatting over sales. Now that sounds weird to let a salesman do something like that today in your house, but it really wasn't unusual back then, and she wasn't the only person on my route who always made coffee when I showed up. So one day, I'm at the sink filling the coffee pot in the kitchen. She's talking to me from her part of the addition, maybe about 12 feet away from where I stood. I glanced up out the window over the sink and saw something dark brown just off the right side of the back porch. After a second, I saw it was moving and I realized that whatever it was, was alive. It was with shock that I realized I was looking at a Bigfoot. The movement I had seen was its head turning up to look at something. I don't know what it saw. It was about the same distance from me as my customer was, maybe 11 or 12 feet. I had a really good view of it. Dark brown fur, head that sat right on its shoulders. I was only seeing it from the side, and then for a moment when it turned a bit to look up and to the side at whatever it was looking at, I could see a bit more of the face. It was furry too, except for the nose, the lips, and right around the eyes. I had seen that film of Bluff Creek Bigfoot back then in some documentary on television, and I have to say, this was a classic looking Bigfoot, if there is such a thing. 
big, wide, massive. Those are all just words that don't really tell you what it's like to be seeing one up close. I didn't have a way to be exactly sure of its height, but I know it was well over seven feet tall, and I don't care how much someone pads a suit. They can't walk and look like what I saw walking across that yard. And why would they bother? Why hoax me? I'm just the jeweled tea man. After a second or so, and it had walked off towards the trees at the end of the yard, I was pretty shook up, and I asked my customer about it. She had no idea what I was talking about. Now this probably doesn't sound very scary or exciting to any of you, but at the time, I was thunderstruck. I'm not a writer, and I don't know how to tell you how it impacted me, really. No, it wasn't attacking me. It wasn't throwing things or making noises. But there it was. It was real, and it had only been a few feet away from me, this thing that I had only seen on the television, and they thought didn't even exist. I'm 76, almost 77 years old now, and I'm still shook up by what I saw that day. Although I sold to that same customer until she passed away in 1975, and I often looked every time I was there, I never saw another thing. I've never seen a Bigfoot again, but it's okay. I have seen one, not once, but I firmly believe twice, so I know they are real, and that's all I care about. Thanks for listening, Phil. For a while, we lived in Lucasville, Ohio, not far from the correctional facility. There was a good bunch of trees between us and them, but we were close enough that we were always mindful that if there's ever an escape, they could be on our property. Because if I was them escaping, I know I would head for that batch of trees too. But to my knowledge, there was never an escape there. But for a while, I really thought maybe there was. I even called the corrections facility to ask, thinking that there really had been an escapee and they were just keeping it out of the news. But they assured me there had been no escape. I thought maybe there was something like that going on because one night we laid in bed and heard someone or something moving things on our back deck, which was right below our bedroom window on the back of the house. I heard the scrape of the outdoor furniture on the deck wood. Now I knew what that sound was because I'd heard it a million times over the years. The deck is partially covered, so I couldn't see anything from our bedroom window. I got up out of bed, got the shotgun out of the closet just in case, and went down to see if it was an animal or a person on my deck. I got down there and I looked out the windows in the kitchen onto the deck, and I couldn't see anything. I checked a little more, flipped on the light, and still didn't see anything. Satisfied it was probably a raccoon, I went back up to bed. But the next day, I saw that the big bag of sunflower seed that we had stored in a small Rubbermaid container on the back had been torn open. It was almost right under the kitchen window, so I couldn't have seen it in the night before. I yelled at my daughter because she was supposed to fill the feeder and put the totes that we kept all the seeds in back in the garage so it didn't attract animals. Now I had seed that had fallen through the deck cracks and I was pretty sure I would have mice up against the house in no time at all. The next thing that happened was the garbage cans. I used to leave them outside the garage, but something started getting into them and going through them and leaving a huge mess. I even tried those raccoon-proof garbage cans with straps and ties, but it didn't matter. Finally, we started putting the garbage cans into the garage, which stunk everything up. Then this happened. My daughter started screaming one night. I jumped out of my chair in the living room and ran toward the family room where she had been on the computer. Now the computer desk sat in the corner of that room and faced the wall, but to the right of the computer desk was a window, so when you sat there the window was just behind your right shoulder. 
Now, she about knocked me over coming out of the family room as I was running to it. She was pretty hysterical and said there had been a man looking in the window at her. Well, of course, I called the sheriff's department, and they came out, but didn't find anything at all. My daughter was pretty watchful after that night and was always looking around outside. One evening, she ran into the living room and said that she had seen someone walking around our detached garage out back. She said she saw it clearly since the garage is painted white, and whoever it was, they were big and they were wearing all dark clothing. Again, I called the sheriff's department, and again, they found nothing. Later that night, we were hearing noises from within the tree area out back like branches breaking and snapping. I really thought someone was out there. And so the next day, that's when I called the corrections facility. Something weird was going on, but we couldn't nail down what it was. Things were being moved around the house while we were gone, or it happened overnight. We were hearing strange howls and screams from the trees out back. One night, as we were all in the family room, we kept hearing these weird, soft thud noises coming from the open window. So I walked out on the back deck, and I listened, and I heard something hitting the grass. Turns out, rocks were being thrown from the trees beyond the garage into the yard. I counted 27 of those stones the next day. Stones that were as big as my fist. I had to pick them up before I could mow, and I counted each one I picked up. I don't know who was throwing them, but they had a really strong arm on them, I thought. Now, my daughter was 17, and she was the first to get home during the day as a rule. My son got off his bus about 20 minutes later. Our driveway from the road was fairly long, and the first 50 feet or so in from the road was clear all around the driveway. But after that, a line of trees began to curve toward the driveway and came up close to it and ran along it down one side, most of the additional length of the driveway. This was the driveway my son and daughter had to walk to get to the house after they got off the bus. I drove home one day to find both my son and my daughter sitting at the end of the driveway near the road. They were both very upset, and my daughter had been visibly crying. The story I finally got out of them was that when my daughter got home and began to walk down the driveway, there had been something in the trees. She said she saw it before she got to the portion of the driveway that was lined by the trees. Frightened, she walked back down to the road, waiting and hoping that it would go away. She didn't know what to do. She was too scared to try to walk down the drive. So when my son got home, she met him off the bus and she told him what she'd seen. Even though he said she had been crying, he called BS on her story, and together they started to walk down the driveway together. They had just started walking where the trees lined the drive, he said, and it came out at them. They said that it just walked right out of the trees and was heading straight for them. And what chilled me was, my son said it wasn't looking at them or at him. It was looking directly at my daughter. They turned and ran back together to the road and waited for more than an hour out there till I got home. During that time, they said they were hearing all sorts of noises from the trees. Wood knocks, tree branch breaking, and some kind of weird snuffling, huffing sound. That was the best they could describe it. So I finally asked them again what had come out at them, because they still hadn't said what it was. It was hard to get the story out of them because they were both so upset, but they finally told me it was something like a gorilla. Then my son stopped and he said, Okay, Dad, what we saw, it was a Bigfoot. 
Now I stood there and I didn't know what to believe. But I did believe I had two very scared teenagers on my hands. So they got in the car and we drove down the driveway to the house together. I drove slowly and looked through the trees, but I didn't see anything as we drove. But their story, with all the weird things that had been happening, had now put me really on edge. I called the sheriff's department once again, and again they came out, and once again they found nothing. I did not say that my children thought it was a Bigfoot out there that had scared them, but we just said someone dressed in a costume maybe, but there had been someone out there frightening them. Now we had already been calling the sheriff's department a lot. I really didn't want them to think we were pranking them by saying we thought there was a Bigfoot in the trees. But me? Well, I still wasn't on board with it being a Bigfoot. I thought someone was trying to prank them, or us, as a family. So I started questioning my daughter about any boys at school that she might have rejected, or made fun of, or anything that might give me the idea it was just someone scaring them. I asked my son the same questions. Had he upset any of the boys at school? Had he been being bullied? Was someone picking on him? Someone who might think this was a great joke to tell at school? But I got no answers. They insisted there was nothing and no one. Now after someone looking in the window, seeing someone around the garage, and her experience in the driveway, my 17-year-old daughter became almost a recluse in the house. She refused to walk to or from the end of our driveway anymore. So with only a few weeks of school left in the year, we made the arrangements and my wife began to drop my daughter off at a neighbor's house on the way to work every morning. And she got on the bus with the kids that lived there and then waited there until her mom picked her up in the afternoon on her way home from work. To me, the fact that my daughter didn't argue about having to get up earlier or having to sit at someone's house for a couple hours after school every day made me believe that whatever had scared her, she was very serious about being scared. My son, however, stuck it out, and he stayed at home and caught the bus at home as usual. He was never bothered by this creature, and it seems, after thinking about it, it had no interest in my son at all. And I thought about that over the weeks till the school was out that year. And it unnerved me very badly. Now any parent out there will understand the fear of someone that might be stalking your child. And we all know how there are some dangerous weirdos out there who fixate on high school girls. And that had both me and my wife scared to death. We were pretty sure that whoever or whatever it was, the main interest was our daughter. The final time we encountered this Bigfoot, or whatever it was, was a few weeks after school let out. My daughter had a friend staying over that night. They were in her bedroom doing whatever teenage girls do all night, when suddenly all hell broke loose. They were screaming, and I could hear something outside was screaming. Things in the room were being broken. Everyone in the house, me, my wife, my son, we all jumped up and ran towards her room. And we were met by two very hysterical girls in the hallway. When we got the story out of them, they said they were lying on the bed, just talking, when they heard something like a zipping, scraping noise go across the window screen. Just as they began to look over, they saw the screen was being pushed into the room and a hand and arm came in and was trying to grab one of them off the bed. Now, they were pushing each other and rolling off the bed, which was all the screaming and all the things br being broken that we heard. They both said the arm and the hand was covered in dark fur, but the palm part that they saw was like charcoal-colored leather. They said it was a very human hand and had a thumb very much like any humans. They did not see any face outside the window, however, 
They couldn't see past the hand and the arm and a portion of the shoulder that had pushed through the window. I called the sheriff's office again, and I reported an attempted break-in and an attempted abduction. While the sheriff's deputy agreed that the window screen had been pushed in, they did not agree that it was an attempted abduction. I was pretty steamed by that. I guess we had just been calling them one too many times in the last couple months, because not only did they take their sweet time getting out there, once there, they were pretty uninterested in making any kind of a report. I asked the girls who was where, and it turns out that my sick hunch was right. My daughter was the one closest to the window. I knew now, and I firmly believe and will never be convinced of anything else, that that thing was trying to take her. It was a difficult night all around. Our guest, of course, called her parents and ultimately went home, but not before speaking to the sheriff's deputy. I had to try to explain everything to her parents. Parents, by the way, who were there on the scene long before the sheriff's department showed up, if that tells you anything. I don't know what the girl's parents thought, and I really don't care. I tried to be honest. I told them everything and she backed up everything that had happened. In the end, of course, as I said, she went home for the night. My daughter refused to sleep in her bedroom anymore and was literally sleeping on the hallway in a sleeping bag simply because there were no windows there. Within the week, and after much thought, conversation, discussion, and frustration, we came to an agreement and made arrangements with my sister for my daughter to stay with her in Chillicothe for a while. I didn't like not having my daughter there, but our fear was that this thing was absolutely fixated on her and we wanted her out of harm's way. Even though we really had no more issues and we did see the Bigfoot at a distance a few more times, no matter what happened, I never called the Sheriff's Department again. But by the time the summer ended and that thing had figured out that she wasn't there anymore, we began to hear and see less and less of it. We had come to some other decisions as well and we decided we didn't want to be there anymore because our daughter wasn't going to feel safe at that house. It took us until that winter, but we did sell that house and we actually moved closer to my sister in Chillicothe. No more properties surrounded by trees and forests for us. I'm done with that. And from that day till now, my daughter always makes sure that her bed is as far away from the window as she can push it. Even now that she's a grown woman, married, and has two children of her own, she still will not sleep with an open window. And neither will will she allow it for her children? My message to you is don't ever think that those things aren't attracted to female humans. They most certainly are. All I'm saying to everyone is be very watchful of your women folk. That's all. Thanks, Marty.